everyone. Second session of Zephyr Tech Talks. Um, it was great to see that there's already quite a few people that were lined up in the um, in the chat. Uh, so we're streaming live on both LinkedIn and YouTube. So wherever you're joining us from, welcome. Um, last time, one thing that I, one thing that I really liked to see in the first few minutes of the of the show was uh, everyone saying hi from wherever they are in the world, and we had people from. Austria, Australia, um, many people from uh, yeah, all over Europe, all over Asia, all over the US. So uh, uh, it was really, really nice to see. So please, um, yeah, take some time to say to say hi. And uh, today we're going to talk about all things modems. Uh, so as a reminder, Zephyr Tech Talks are um, we do them every other week, uh, maybe more often in the future. So hint, hint, if you're interested in, in being a speaker in the future, uh, please reach out. Uh, but yeah, so far it's gonna be every two weeks. And today uh, we're gonna talk about a new feature that's coming in for um, Zephyr 3.5 that's helping it, um, helping um, um, do all things modem much more easily. And there's many sorts of modems and uh, I don't know much about modems myself, except that maybe a few decades ago, I was using a dial-up modem to connect to the internet, just like maybe many of you guys. Uh, but Bjarki, our guest for today, certainly knows a lot. So um, without further ado, let's just welcome Bjarki uh, on stage. Hey, Bjarki. Hello. How's it going? Hey, great. How, uh, where are you yeah. joining us from, actually? Denmark. Nice. Uh, so yeah, like maybe before we like dive into into today's topic, can you maybe tell us a bit about uh, about yourself, what you do uh, for a living, like uh, what's uh, what got you started using using Zephyr, and then maybe we can uh, talk more specifically about modern stuff. Sure. Uh, yeah, I work in embedded firmware, um, and essentially, I just have it has been my hobby since forever. So I both do it as my job, of course, while working on better firmware. And then, yeah, I was introduced to Zephyr. And from then on, it just kind of started rolling really fast because I really like API designs and, yeah, open source software, creating things that will actually be used by others. Uh, that's kind of a passion of mine uh, to create or make the embedded world more approachable to everyone. Um, and this, yeah, is a very nice way, I think, of doing that. Simply getting to work on something, sharing it, and having it improved, and having everyone work together to create something that is just better than, uh, yeah. I think more people working on one thing just makes it better. Yeah, and so and uh, so yeah, you mentioned that you like doing API stuff. So you've been working on modems recently, but that's not your first rodeo, right? You, you've been uh, yeah. working on real-time clocks as well. Is that correct? Yeah, that's the, the one I started with. So uh, that's kind of uh, how I got into, nah, not really. So the, the very first thing I did was I tried to implement or expand the sensor API to include location to essentially bypass making a GNSS API, um, which was then completely shut down. Fair enough. And then after that, I started working on the RTC API, which had been stale for quite a while and then spent a lot of time doing that um, because again, it, it just, it's really interests me uh, to work together on stuff. Uh, so that was quite cool. And after about half a year that got implemented and there from there, from there on, I then started working on the modem subsystem because we use modem set track units. So having this subsystem be very good and approachable and well maintained, it's kind of uh, good for everyone. <laughs> And uh, then after working on it for uh, three or four months, I realized that I had something really cool and I wanted to share it a bit more. So I ended up using a lot of time making it really approachable and easy to use. And of course, just working on making it stable because I really want it to, let's say, take off uh, to have everyone have a good basis for creating something very easy to use and scalable. Um, and, and yeah, yeah and maybe out of that. curiosity, because I realized that myself, I don't actually know a lot about your company that you you just mentioned. What what do you guys do? Like, I, I'm assuming it's, it's some kind of connected devices, yeah. right? Uh, we uh, work with uh, the construction industry to eliminate downtime. 
So we essentially make telematics devices and implement other or telematics device APIs from other vendors to provide one place to see how all of your equipment is doing. So we both have telematics devices to share that. And we also have uh, smaller devices, uh, beacons uh, called Kintags for the smaller equipment. So you can track essentially everything on a work site. So that's what we do. And of course, having a telematics device, it needs to be connectable uh, to the outside world. And for that, essentially everyone uses modems. That's kind of where we're at uh, so far. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, all right. Uh, so, well, like I said in the intro, it's even more mind blowing uh, than last time. We have people from all over the world. I don't know, Bjorki, if you got a chance to, and if you were paying attention while I was putting uh, everyone's uh, greetings on screen, but we have people from Mongolia, Brazil, th South Africa, India, California, it's not a country, but yeah, Athens, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's really, really cool. Um, and yeah, how about we just uh, get started? I think you're, um, you got the memo. I've been asking all the, uh, the past and future guests to bring hardly any slides and mostly just demos uh, so that we can really have something super interactive. So I think mm -hmm. you bought something that's kind of in between. <laughs> you have uh, you have some some drawings maybe to help get us started because like yeah. like I said myself like I mean modems some of us are probably familiar with like the general idea of what a modem is but we might necessarily realize that there's many kinds of modems, not necessarily uh, modems that are related to connecting to the internet. It probably can do more than that. So yeah, how about you uh, just tell us a, a bit more? Okay, so essentially what a modem is, is a radio used to communicate with the outside world where all of the, let's say, communication stuff, like the radio, the protocols, etc., are stored in this one device. So it's essentially a device created to connect to other devices. Um, and we then create a, a driver for the MCU that's connected to the modem to essentially make the modem do our bidding. <laughs> so the modem will will tell it to connect to some network, for example. It could be a Wi-Fi modem connecting to a router, or it could be an LTE modem connecting to one of those giant, you know, 8G or 4G <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um And from there on, we can then tell it to transmit packages for us, so data uh, back and forth. Um, so the, the modem itself is a self-contained device. And our MCU is, of course, also a self-contained device where we have our drivers. And the modem subsystem is used to make the communication from the modem and our host, um, which is like the big MCU running our code, uh, be able to command the modem to do stuff in a simplistic way and in, in an approachable way. And one of the good things about modems in general is that it's quite a, it, they have been here for a while. So the ways they work is quite generic and there are actual standards to use now. Um, and these modem modules are created to essentially take these generic approaches um, or protocols that are used and wrap them into something that's easy. That way, essentially whatever modem you have, you can use the same base modules to translate whatever you want them to do. So for many of them, you send something that looks like text to it. So like a com console, so you would tell it to connect to something by writing AT plus something and a new line. Um, and essentially one of these mod modules called chat uh, makes that programmatically. So you can essentially tell it, please write this and then expect to get this response. And when you get this response, call this handler. Um, so these mechanisms are wrapped so they're actually usable um yeah from the outside yeah cool. so a little i have this terrifying thing that is what i use <laughs> for modem testing and in this case an nf 9160 connected to a quick quick till modem up here which is a cellular modem so that's the larger ones of the antennas that connect to the radio tower and then there's also two gnss's um, and that's then connected with a giant or one of these guys, a patch antenna, because yeah, GNSS requires quite, um, yeah, good receivers. And yeah, so essentially what we want to do is to have the Zephyr code running on our host right here, connect through these wires that represent the UART, that's these up here, and they actually need to tell the modem here what to do. Um, 
And that's what the modem subsystem does. It uh, essentially takes all the communication going over these wires and makes it an API, a function call. Please send this packet. And everything in between is handled by the subsystem. And yeah, that would be the same for the uh, this one, the GNSS, which also sends text looking data over a UART. So there, there are a lot of commonalities in the way that they work. And uh, that's why the subsystem makes sense to take the common parts and have them only once and then making them shareable uh, between different drivers. Okay, makes sense. Um, so did you want to share anything uh, on screen? Sure. Um, we'll take the first test, I think. Uh, okay. I'll just. And to everyone uh, watching us, and I think some of you already started to, to engage, but uh, any questions, anything that comes to, to your yeah. mind and that you would like to ask uh, Bjarki, just please uh, yeah, drop, drop this in the chat. Uh, but yeah, looking forward to the, the cool demos. So the first demo is um, using the subsystem uh, to create or as a basis for a GNSS driver. So in this case, um, the GNSS driver is sending something called NMEA commands, which are text-based commands. And uh, these commands then need to be understood and they need to be parsed uh, to something that is usable on a, on a processor. So something going from a number like 1.123 needs to be an integer value so that you can actually use it on the modem. Um, so the first thing we're going to look at is an NMEA or uh, the GNSS driver working with the, uh, what's this called? Oh, I'll have to reset that. There we go. Uh, so what you see here is essentially the data that's being received from a GNSS as it's starting up. So the modem modules essentially lay the foundation to pass all the data. And then this is running a GNSS sample application that is taking all the data from the GNSS, like all the satellites it has seen, and their elevation and azimuth, which tells us where they are in the uh, or in their orbit around the world, and what system they use, and if they're used to actually calculate a location. And of course, it also shows us the past data. So it essentially tells you everything that the modem is giving us in, let's say, a uh, more usable fashion. So it takes all of the text-based uh, communication from the modem, and in this case, a GNSS modem, and makes it uh, usable for our application that can actually take this value for right here and do something with it, calculate it. So that's the first demo. Uh, the, the fortunate thing is that these things are actually quite simple uh, when they're working. They they, they just work. Uh, so yeah, yeah first demo. The, the beauty of like, like like you mentioned, like it's uh, in many ways modems and AT commands. Like it's really really old school, but that's that's the good thing because it makes things more, I guess, easy to to handle at at the generic um, level. Mm -hmm. So essentially, all when you have a subsystem like this, all the driver does, which is what is actually setting up the specific device you have or specific modem, is telling it uh, to power on, uh, configuring specific proprietary things. Uh, like some of them, you can set, uh, for example, which system do you want to systems do you want to use? Like, do you want to track GPS and GLONASS or just GPS, which can save you power? Uh, stuff like that uh, would be implemented by the driver. Um, but most of the generic things, like actually receiving this data and uh, the GNSS info, those are just generic paths that any uh, modern driver can implement. So the subsystem essentially gives you the ability to make a base driver that does most of the things, and then everything a proprietary or special proprietary, in this case, means special to that device, not secret. Uh, <laughs> But um, yeah, what um, you need to do to, for example, power this one off, because they usually have some special command that makes sense for their device. Um, but all of that is, of course, hidden behind the GNSS API, which gives you functions like set a GNSS system, and you just tell it which to set, and whatever commands or what needs to happen to actually make the modem do your bidding uh, is handled by the driver with the subsystem. Yeah. And yeah. quickly, a quick uh, uh, selfish question there, but uh, at a high level, like what's the difference between GPS and GLONASS and uh, Galileo and a few of the others you, you had there? 
Um, the difference largely is who made them, which radio frequencies are they using. Um, so all satellites are not exactly the same. Um, so you need to be listening on these specific frequencies uh, for the specific data that's sent from those specific satellites. Uh, so GNSS modems will essentially support a range of them, usually not all of them, um, and often only one or two constellations. Uh, and a constellation is essentially an amount of satellites using the same system. So GPS is one of the earlier ones, maybe the first one, not entirely sure, but. Uh, for example, those are the ones uh, or satellites sent up from America. And those satellites are then, yeah, you essentially can say, I want to listen only for those satellites for whatever reason. Maybe you're in America and they have a good coverage there or something like that. So you don't necessarily need to be listening for Baidu satellites, which mm -hmm. maybe you don't see as many of. For example, if you want to really power optimize, you can look and see, hey, there's only one Galileo yeah, satellite. Doesn't make sense to. Mm -hmm. Let's just turn that off and then use the ten from the GPS and GLONASS systems. So yeah, that's essentially it. What, yeah, uh, which system are they using collectively? Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, so uh, that's uh, GNSS. The second one is a bit cooler. So I'm going to use some drawings to kind of show how. I think it's simple. <laughs> it is now yeah. to actually use these modules and give you kind of an idea of how it works. And for that, I've created these amazing paintings. So essentially, what you have is, of course, your modem. In this case, this is a uh, cellular modem. So we expect to be sending network tra traffic on them. So you have your actual physical modem that's connected with some physical bus. And that bus then needs um, essentially to send data. So just send raw bytes back and forth. So everything that's sent between here are just raw bytes. They're not, uh, they of course have some meaning, but um, how you send the bytes from the subsystem to the modem really doesn't matter. The modem just expects to get bytes. Uh, so what the subsystem essentially does is create a very generic API called the pipe API, which is just, the most generic form of pipe, data in, data out. And then it has an event. So when there's data ready, you get an event saying, hey, there's data, please read it. It's very, very simple um, because it ha it needs to be essentially. So for example, the UART, which is real hardware that is used in the UART device driver API, um, that is wrapped inside of one of these backends. And the backend is essentially taking some real hardware and then uh, adapting the pipe API to work with it. So when you're using the UART backend, it will take the raw, let's say 10 bytes you want to send, and it will tell or use the UART to send that data. And everything above this backend doesn't care how that happened. It just cares that the 10 bytes I want to the modem should be sent to the modem. So you could, for example, take uh, here, you could say, okay, I don't want to send, uh, what's that called? I want to use a speed down here, um, which many modems uh, use. Oh. So in this case, you would simply create a backend, um, pretend it says backend, uh, down here that uses speed to communicate to the modem. Or it could be IPC, or it could be I squared C, or it could be any transport layer um, to send data to the modem. And the backend, or a backend would be created for everyone, and it would just have a write, read, and data ready uh, function call. This is important because the upper layer or the more, uh, let's say, generic uh, modules, like the chat module, which is what listens for text-based input and sends text-based output, meaning it will listen for something like AT plus CREG. And when it hears that, it will, or hears, when it pro uh, receives that, it will process it. And it's just receiving it as raw data. It doesn't care how it got there. Um, it's just seeing data. And then uh, if, uh, yeah, if it wants to send something to the modem, it will just send AT enter, for example. That will be sent to the backend, to the UART in this case, to the modem. And this is very nice. Uh, the cool thing about the system is that you can take at any point you can just reconnect them. So you can say, okay, now I want the chat module to use speed, for example. 
doesn't make sense in this case, but you can essentially just switch between them. Uh, PPP is another module. In this case, that is sending, uh, what's it called? Uh, network packets to the modem. Again, what's coming out of it is just bytes. So it just needs a Pi API. So what you have here, for example, is, well, you only have one UART. Um, so you would start by connecting the chat mo modem, send a command saying, hey, please enter data mode. Then you would reattach uh, this backend to the PPP modem. So you would essentially cut that one and connect this one. And now you can send raw data to the same UART to the modem, and the chat just doesn't hear anything. So you can, at runtime, you can switch between them as you please, essentially. Um, so you can have, yeah, multiple uh, forms of data going over to the modem, in this case, one at a time. But then comes something quite cool, which is called CMOOCs, which allows you to essentially take the data you get over here. So you just get raw data from this one and raw data from that one. And it uses a, again, generic protocol to encode this. So on the one you are to the modem, you can now send multiple um, raw streams of data. So in this case, it's actually quite cool. You would start out by connecting the chat directly to the backend UART modem. So you could say, hey, please enable CMOOCs. Then you take this uh, channel and disconnect it and connect it to a DLCI channel, which is one of these virtual channels. And that one is also using the pipe API. So the chat really doesn't care how the data is coming over to the modem. It just it used that one, and now it used this one to send data. And the PPP, in this case, can actually get its own virtual channel. So now you can tell the chat modem to please uh, set this channel into data mode. And then this uh, your networking module here, called just PPP, um, is able to send network packets over, and you can send 80 commands over. So you can ask, what's the network reg registration like while also sending packets? So this is kind of the power of the subsystem. You can switch these um, as you like during runtime while it's running. Um, so yeah, that's essentially what the system does. Uh, with that, I maybe we should go yeah, to There's the actually two, two, two questions, uh, one for each slide, pretty much. Uh, yeah, one uh, from Jonathan that I had myself the, the other day when, when trying to, to use the subsystem with, with the modem I had. Uh, when doing things like 4G, 5G, 8G, like you said, um, you like one might require higher bandwidth um, uh, buses, like maybe USB. Is this something that's uh, um, possible and or easy to, to use with the, the subsystem? Well, I, I, I and some modems might actually only support it, USB. <laughs> so uh, you can essentially you can already do this kind of. So the again the back end doesn't care the f which physical layer you're using. So if you have USB, you would create a backend for uh, the whatever abstraction USB uses. I think they're called something like ACM ports or something like that. So you would essentially connect uh, the modem via USB, and the modem would create a virtual COM port, and you would then create a backend that sent data to, through the virtual COM port. Um, and then again, you would still be using PVP and chat. So it is actually a thought into the design that it doesn't matter what uh, channel you're using down here, you can also use USB. Um, you just need to implement the backend for it. And then everything above it, again, it doesn't care. It just wants to send data to the modem. In some oh, cases, yeah. uh, it can be even more interesting because the modem can use the same USB to open three virtual COM ports. And then you can have one backend uh, for each COM port. And then you actually have CMOOCs again. <laughs> but in this case, you're using a USB uh, to essentially create virtual channels. So right. yeah, it, it is built to be that flexible, essentially. Nice. And speaking of CMOOCs, uh, Roman is asking, is it possible to mix PPP and chat API using CMOOC commands, which I think we, we saw, uh, but yep. also um, says that some modems don't support CMOOCs, but uh, custom multiplexer mode like Emacs, for example, is this supported? Um, I have not heard of Emacs, but the the thing that makes the modem subsystem quite approachable is that every one of these modules, you can create new modules. We're not limited to any of these. So 
if you have, uh, let's say, this emus in this case, oh, I cannot draw on this. There we go. Uh, so let's say you have something like emus, which again, I'm guessing here, <laughs> but I would guess uh, you have emus that can create multiple channels. Um, and then you would essentially create for each of these virtual channels, they're called DLCI for CMOOCs. I don't know what they will be called here, but let's just say it's called port one and port two. Um, as long as these uh, individual, uh, let's say, channels are implementing the Pipe API, um, you would essentially do this. So you would create a new modem module called modem emooks, and you would then expose the channels with the Pipe API, and you would then connect chat and PPP to those. So absolutely, um, if you have other, uh, let's say, they don't even have to be standard, but if you have other ways of communicating, you simply create a new module because they're dependent on the same uh, pipes. So both the emus would be connected through a pipe API to the backend, which is generic, and the inputs to the channels are also generic using the pipe API. So yes, um, it's definitely built to support that. Currently, there's no emux module. I have not even heard of it. But if you want to create that module, go right ahead. It is open to you know be expanded. Yeah, go ahead, Roman. I know you're already super active on 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 sending lots of pull requests. But yeah, I wasn't familiar with emux myself uh, either. Uh, Another question, uh, this one is actually super interesting from Joao. Uh, there's many modems that do support, like they run like a full-blown MQTT client and they take care of like connecting to a server and uh, uh, like uh, abstracting this out and offloading some of the work of, of the, the host um, uh, MCU. Uh, mm -hmm. Would it be possible to have, um, like to interface with those uh, MQTT commands using the, the chat modules? And what are the advantages of uh, using PPP over such internal MQTT commands? Okay, so yeah, the usually the, um, what's it called? The benefits of using PPP is that you are using Essentially, you have the entire network stack on your side. So when you're creating a packet, like a DCLS packet or something like that, you're essentially doing everything on your host processor where everything is quite fast because you're writing directly to memory, where uh, when you start offloading stuff, you get uh, limited by the uh, both, of course, the uh, pipe, because you usually have to be a little more, you can't just send the raw data often, you have to package it and you have to wait for a response. So for example, if you're offloading a UDP channel, you would first ask the modem, please go into UDP mode. You would then send the data and then you would wait for the modem to respond. And then you would do the same and essentially drive around. So the, the send acknowledge part of it is quite slow. But the uh, upside to using the offloaded ones is of course processing overhead and you know flash size because your host processor is now not doing all of that work. So you essentially have that, uh, let's say, yeah, you have to work on. A, it is faster if you're doing all the work yourself and just sending the raw data, um, but it takes up more space and processing power. Um, and if you're offloading it, you save that power, but it's a bit slower. However, on the other end, uh, if you're having as much as possible on your host processor, which you really should be trying to for this reason, um, if there's a bug on the modem, then having essentially to fix that bug, it is closed source code and it will require from update and a lot of back and forth. And it's uh, quite a hassle once the issue is not on your side. If you're having the entire stack on your side, you can go in and debug it and actually fix it. So you have those, I would say, three things to uh, worry about uh, when it comes to choosing which ones uh, you use. Um, yeah, but. At the very least, uh, the idea is the backends take care of the physical uh, connection. So from that part, the modem modules will always be useful. Um, and whatever, uh, let's say, modules you build on top of those, if they're uh, generic enough, then yeah, chat, for example, is used for AT-based commands or similar, which I use quite widely. But again, you are free to create new modules with whatever API fits what you're doing. Um, there, is of course already an a socket offloading API, um, or that's just a yeah network offloading API. So again, if the data you're sending is still text based, then you would still be using the chat module to format whatever um, your socket offloading is doing. So yeah, it 
it just depends on how it works. Usually, yeah, you'll be able to create a module that will help you bind Zephyr uh, or the network stack or your application to the modem. Um, yeah. OK. Uh, so there's tons of questions lining up. Uh, uh, and as a host of, of this show, I should say that I, was, I wasn't sure there would be questions. That I, I was thinking of questions that I would be asking you, but it turns out that people uh, uh, come up with the same questions. Uh, just one quickly, uh, yes. Ben says that the Zephyr documentation for PPP says that the PPP support in Zephyr 2.0 is still experimental. Uh, yes. Thoughts on that? So should we, is there anything in the documentation that needs updating or it's still considered experimental? The, okay, so the modem module- And, and as said, it, it, should, it might be so, updated. Yeah, okay, so I'm just gonna create a new layer here. So, I can draw this up, bonk. So essentially, PVP is kind of a, an interesting, let's say, part of Zephyr right now. So we essentially have the layer two uh, PPP, um, and we have whoop, uh, the modem module PPP. So the experimental part is this one. Uh, so part of the Zephyr network stack. Uh, this is essentially sending and receiving net packets uh, between the modem to set up a PPP session. And then once that session is set up, it will route net packets like IP packets um, to the modem. The, this is still experimental, yes, uh, but it is working quite well. It's still getting some uh, updates every now and again, but yeah, it is experimental. Like I made some changes to it. Yeah, there have been changes made to this one within the last two months. So it's still being updated, but it is definitely functional. Um, this one is uh, quite a bit easier. So the modem module PVP is just uh, taking the network packets that are coming from the network stack or the upper stack and wrapping them uh, in PPP packets. So that there are some, let's say, uh, naming collisions here. <laughs> uh, but they're taking the raw packets and then some of the bytes uh, are reserved and the, it, there's a checksum and stuff like that. Um, so that's what this one is doing. So the data that's coming out is going from net packet to draw bytes, essentially, that are these wrapped packets. And then coming in the reverse, again, this one will receive those wrapped packets, unwrap them into something that is just a raw net packet, all uh, allocated, and then send it up again. So this is um, a wrapper uh, before it goes on the like transport layer. Uh, yeah, so this one is not experimental. Uh, it's also quite simple, but it's very new. So it's not like it's perfect either, I think. Up, to, right. up until now it's worked, we'll see. Uh, yeah, but uh, this one, I don't know. I don't know why it is still experimental since it is actually working, uh, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think Anas in the chat said that maybe uh, we need to just update the documentation. Um, there is another question from Byram. Uh, in constrained devices, there's not enough memory for enabling both PPPP and TCP IP stacks. So would that be possible to create chat commands for TCP connect, send, receive, and then hook them up to the socket API without having to use PPP and to enable the full TCP IP stack? Uh, yeah, so if you're using socket offloading, you would essentially not be using this one at all. <laughs> oh, no, right. I can write it. Damn it. There we go. No. There we go. Come on. I just want to cross it out. There we go. So if uh, you could not use PPP at all, if you want to use socket offloading, you would only need the chat module. Um, because essentially uh, what that is doing is the you're using the IP stack to say, hey, I want to open a UDP connection. And you would essentially get a, a request from the network stack to the driver that would then uh, yeah, find out, okay, what command, AT command, do we want to or need to send to the modem to make it open the UDB connection? And what will it respond with when it is opened? And when we're told to send a packet on that socket, um, how are we? How do we make the modem enter data mode? And how do we package that data and send it? So in that case, you would be using the chat module to do all of the parsing, at least for an AT-based uh, modem. 
and uh, yeah, the upper network stack to essentially request what should happen. So you don't need to use PPP. Um, but yeah, then we would have chat. Probably you would not use CMOX either because then you just have one channel anyway. So you would have the chat connect to the backend UART modem uh, in that case. And then okay. this one, yeah, your driver would just be figuring out what text do I send and what do I want to or need to get back. Okay. Uh, another question is from Partiban. What if CMOX is not supported by the modem, for example, with the PC68? Yes, then we're back to uh, this mode. Mo uh, yeah, drawing again. So in that case, if you don't have CMOOCs, you can only do one at a time. Uh, so if you have uh, the possibility of using PPP in that case, you would first connect the chat module or modem to the or chat module to the modem. You would then ask the modem. Uh, you would essentially start by setting it up and uh, yeah, writing whatever uh, passwords and making it register to a network, making sure that it's ready. Then once it is ready, you would ask the modem to switch over to PPP mode. And then you would cut this uh, connection here and you would reattach the pipe to the PPP module and essentially tell it that, hey, uh, the carrier is ready. You can now send data to the modem. And yeah, that's how you would uh, do it in that case. So you would simply switch between. And then whenever you lose connection, like you lose the carrier, then you would switch them back again. So you would connect the chat module. You would ask, hey, what happened? Try to reconnect and then do this back and back and forth. OK. And another question is, should there be more than um, one virtual port? Can there be more than one chat module? Yeah. Uh, all of these modules are built to be uh, yeah infinitely expandable, if you would call it that, So or instantiatable. So mm -hmm. each module, be the PVP or chat or the UART backend or SPI or whatever, all of those um, are uh, yeah, can be created just like a device would be. Um, so you can create as many instances as you want. Uh, you essentially just uh, create the context struct for them and create a configuration struct. And uh, you then allocate all of the buffers that it needs. Um, so for each instance, you create buffers for it. And then when you initialize it, you provide it with all the buffers and settings it needs. Um, so you could have, for example, a GNSS modem and a LTE modem on one device, which would require two chat instances. You could even have four GNSS devices if you want that. But yeah, every module here is specifically designed to be replicatable. The Yeah, the only little caveat is with the PPP one, because it's part of the network stack. Uh, every one of these has to be uh, created with a macro in static memory. Um, but yeah, the chat can essentially both yeah, can be created dynamically. So you can uh, you can actually create a new one on the stack if you want to. You shouldn't, but you can. Right, cool. Um, yeah, maybe before we move on to the cool demo that you mentioned, uh, there's yeah. a couple of questions from John. Um, and this one, I think, is on many uh, people's minds. Um, some people might have been using the legacy Zephyr modem drivers and model. Uh, mm -hmm. How does the new system relate to it? Like, what's sort of the, the plan there for users and driver yeah. developers? So the old PPP and uh, CMOOCs and GSM PPP driver have all been deprecated. So from not the next re uh, release, but the next next release, those will be removed. And there's a new driver called Cellular uh, Modem Cellular that is a plugin replacement for it. Uh, so within the next two releases, uh, everyone should move over to the new uh, driver called Modem Cellular that is uh, already ready. That is actually the driver that I'll be demo demoing in a second here. OK, well, yeah, take it away. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I just wanted to very shortly describe what it does. So uh, what the demo is, is we have that monstrosity of a board I showed before uh, that has a modem and the host process on it. So this is just going to be the uh, development kit, I guess. Um, this one will uh, use the modem to connect to one of these big boys, you know, the, the towers. <laughs> Uh, to create a network connection. Um, so that's what the GN or GSM modem will be doing, or cellular modem. Uh, this uh, will then be used to open a connection to a server. Uh, I don't know exactly how to draw that, but a, there is a server uh, hosted by Linode. 
um, which is used to actually test the cellular modems. So I've set up a server um, that will wait for uh, incoming connections, and it will then be listening on a port. We will then be using our development kit to send a packet to the server, which will then echo the same packet back just to show that it is working. And then after that, we will also be asking the server to dump a bunch of data and see how fast we can download it. So essentially, what we have is a sample application that is built to work with the um, yeah this uh, server. And an interesting uh, part of that, uh, the server is actually described here. So if you want to see how that works, it's just a Python script essentially running on this server. Um, so we have the sample uh, here for how it works. Um, and we're essentially just going to see it working. So first, I'll have to build it. So uh, okay. where are we at? That's going to be super exciting. Uh, say for samples, net cellular. Ah. There we go. Yeah, it's not the fastest. But yeah, the idea is to essentially, um, yeah, the reason I created this uh, server is that when you're testing a cellular modem, it's always hard to understand or test is the throughput good enough. If I try to send a bunch of data, will the packets be corrupted? Um, because you, you essentially have to set up some server to send something over the cellular network. And often, uh, you have to resort to setting up some Python script and having a, a local or static IP address to make that work. And it's kind of it's a pain every time because you need to set it up before doing every test. So now this endpoint is just always there. So you can just test a modem at any time. Um, so I, yeah, quite cool. So uh, let's go ahead and run it. We should be able to see that here. Uh-oh. There's a lot of stuff here. Uh, there we go. So now powering up the modem, and that's take a while to uh, connect. So essentially, the modem will try to register to the network. And this is using the modem cellular. And there we go. It's using uh, the modem cellular driver to first connect to the network. Then it will wait for the DNSS server to be ready. It will then perform a lookup of the test endpoint.com, which is the uh, host name of the Linode hosted server. It will then open a socket, and it will then try uh, start transmitting echoes. So in this case, it will send an echo, wait for the response, so tell you how much time it took, and then at the end, give you a, uh, what's that called, an average. After that, it will close the socket. It will then do uh, this interesting test. It will then send 128 packets as fast as it can, as it can using UDP. And once it's done, it will essentially wait for the server to respond back with how many packets it received and how many it dropped. Um, it's sending a, a pseudo random number in all of these packets just to make sure that it's actually receiving real packets so we can detect any bit errors. And in this case, that just worked. So that's very cool. And we can even see the throughput because we know uh, how long it takes to send the packets. And uh, we can therefore calculate our total bytes sent. In this case, 85, 96 bytes per second. It then will restart the modem, which is super important because that's often overlooked in device drivers, being able to power down or power up consistently. In this case, it's just using the PM subsystem to do that. So modem suspend, modem resume, or PM suspend, PM resume. And it will then again open the UDP circuit. It doesn't have to do the DNS, as DNS lookup again. Do the uh, packet again, power down the sample, and I can also see uh, the modem. It is now turned off. So this is essentially giving a very good sample that uh, yeah you can use to test that your modem driver is actually sending things consistently and not failing and not losing packets. Um, yeah, so that was one of the bigger parts of uh, yeah creating the sample, making all of this approachable. So everyone doesn't need to know how to set up a server, how to wait on packets and do the busy work. It's essentially just there. And if someone wants to add some new functionality, like um, I want to have a TCP uh, uh, support added to the server so I can try to open a TCP socket, or 
the service actually already set up as an MQTT broker. So if you want to test that, we can do that too. So yeah, the, the entire thing is just built as one, like a large, very approachable uh, yeah, subsystem with endpoint to essentially make sure that things are working appropriately. Uh, yeah, so that's that was demo number two. Uh, both demos worked nearly the first time, so I will say uh, quite happy with that. Yeah, me too. Uh, th there was a question earlier. Let me make sure I put it uh, on the screen. Uh, uh, again, that's something I'm pretty sure many people um, have in mind as well, especially when you're doing cellular and like uh, you're aiming for low power. Um, does the new model and new um, subsystem support power management uh, and yes. unsolicited notifications? Yes. Um, so if we go to the, yeah, we'll just start with just the example here. We don't need that. We don't need this. Um, so yeah, the uh, device is just using, uh, yeah, it's using the network interface and the power management interface um, generically. So exactly how it looks, uh, we have the main. We want to power on the system. So we use, in this case, the uh, PM runtime subsystem to resume the modem. We then enable the network interface. So the we put up the administrative state, which essentially means uh, when there is a, let's say, network ready, we want it to be enabled. So once the cellular modem has connected to the network and has set up a layer two, PPP, and um, we actually yeah, want to be sending and receiving data. We then wait for the event uh, telling us that we now have layer four connected, which essentially means all the lower layers of the network stack are now working. You can go ahead and open the socket. We then wait for uh, the DNSS server to be added. All of this is just generic. There's nothing uh, here that is, let's say, directly related to a modem. Um, this could be a Wi-Fi modem. It could be an Ethernet adapter. It doesn't really matter. And uh, yeah, performing the NSS request, also standard. Sending packets, also standard. Restarting the modem. Device PM action run suspend. Resume. And we again wait for the event to be connected. So everything here is completely standard. There, there are no shortcuts or custom APIs. It's just using Zephyr. So, Hope that answers the question. I, th I think it does. Um, cool. Um, was there anything else that you wanted to 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 show us? I no, I don't think so. I think we have uh, gone over basically all of it. Um, yeah. So maybe. Nah, I, I don't think so. I well, I guess maybe, maybe the, the, the question to and to make it extra clear for for everyone um, attending. Uh, uh, so the new modem subsystem, it's going to be part of Zephyr 3.5, right? Like that's already uh, yeah, the, the way you demonstrated it. Yes. Yeah. And for GNSS, it's still work work in progress. There's a, yes. a pull request, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a pull request that is basically there. And so it is going through what I would call the final review, final review rounds of the experimental stage. <laughs> so right. uh, there's something that everyone can start working on and find all of the small bugs and things and add support for it. So uh, I would say by next release, it, I would definitely expect it to be both stable and well supported. Um, at least if we look at how fast it was with the RTC, that was also about one release cycle. And then, yeah, there were drivers and stuff was working quite well. Uh, so I'm, I do see it being quite rapid especially because it is, in my opinion, it's actually quite easy to do now to implement these modem drivers because all of the repetitive, boring stuff that just needs to work and be stable is there. Um, and it's also quite heavily tested, uh, which is one of the reasons it's so stable. Um, so yeah, when and if someone wants to actually work on it and add, uh, let's say, extend or fix bugs in the modem or modular or subsystem, um, create a test for it. Uh, essentially, if you find something that doesn't work or something you want to support, um, if you go to the subsystem, modem, and let's say it's CMOX, for example. If you have anything here that you want to add, like you want to, yeah, the, the, the CMOX supports quite a bit of stuff, but you, you can simply go in here, create the test for it, and then expand the modem subsystem. 
and then ensure that the test works. So all of the, yeah, whenever we make some change to it, because we have the pipes, uh, we actually use uh, a mocked pipe. So here we have a pipe that isn't connected to real hardware. It's just a buffer on both ends. So when we're testing here, we essentially see, OK, the CMOOC should be sending this data to the um, to the modem it's connected to, and we should respond with this data. And yeah, you essentially, we can script the entire thing because everything is completely testable. There's nothing that's reliant on actual hardware of these modems, except for the actual backends, because they are they are working on real hardware. There's not, not too much to do there. Um, it's, we do have some emulated hardware now. It's, uh, I think we have emulated UART, for example. So those could also be created tests uh, for those. Don't exist yet, but we could. So yeah, the, the entire process is very stable because everything we add or change, every bug we find, every weird behavior, we just add a test case for it, fix it, and then whenever we create something new in the future, it will be caught if we break something that already exists. Uh, so I'm I'm really happy with that. Uh, simply that, yeah, we can the pipes allow us to isolate them completely the modules. Cool. And I was wondering, is there on your plate or on uh, your radar, uh, would there be other types of technologies and modems uh, that could be supported going forward? Thinking maybe satellite. I don't know if. LoRa and LoRa One, if this would be applicable or useful to uh, sort of try and leverage some of the uh, the modem subsystem, but yeah, uh, is there anything um, you're aware of in that area? Um, I think the the question is more: what can this not solve uh, when it comes to modems? If it is using text-based communication, or if it's using some um, quite generic, it doesn't. Again, it doesn't have to be generic, but to be part of the subsystem, it probably should be used by more than one thing. Otherwise, you can just uh, create the mod uh, modem or module as part of your driver. And um, right. so, yeah, you don't have to, let's say, expose uh, something like the modem CMOOCs. If eMOOCs, for example, was specific to one modem vendor, you could just have it with the drivers for that modem. And um, so, again, it, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. it's nothing really limiting us there. So, yeah, if the satellites or yeah, satellite modems happen to be using commands uh, like text-based commands, then sure, it can uh, be used as the basis for those. Um, it doesn't help with creating APIs on top of them and all of that stuff. Uh, it's just taking the generic stuff and making that, yeah, generic and uh, available. Mm -hmm. So it would make it faster to create those if they're using some of these modules. Right. Um... Right, so yeah, only just a few minutes to go until we wrap things up. But there's um, mm -hmm. still a few questions lined up. One uh, on YouTube, uh, when the MCU waits for the modem's uh, response, does it use polling or the asynchronous API? Uh, so currently it's using polling. Uh, no, sorry, it's using the asynchronous API, but I will probably, or someone will be adding polling to it as well, because for some reason, some modems simply don't uh, understand the uh, CMOOCs really. So sometimes when you send set up CMOOCs, it won't respond with unsolicited commands anymore. You have to do a bit more work uh, to make them actually appear because you're creating three channels and then you somehow need to tell the modem the un a unsolicited commands should be coming in on that channel. <laughs> um, but yeah, that is uh, something we need to look at. But currently it is uh, only using unsolicited commands. Um, so drivers, modem. No, I mean include. Damn it, there's one. Drivers, modem, and cellular. So we have the handlers somewhere in the beginning. No, these ones. So uh, we essentially have handlers for uh, C rec. Um, it's, an, it's called CXREG here because we have the same handler regardless of if it's CREG, CEREG, or CGREG. Um, you essentially get different responses based, and this is in uh, in relation to the registration status. And um, you get different responses depending on what technology it's using. Uh, so here we essentially use the uh, 
the specific name. So we have one handler, and then we just check, uh, was it this one uh, that gave us some status? And all of these are um, unsolicited. So if we actually find where this one is set in, uh, we have uh, these, oh, just do that. We have a bunch of these matches, which are essentially phrases that we'll be waiting on. And when we get one, what uh, delimiters or uh, separators do we want to use? In this case, comma. So we get a bunch of split arcs, uh, arguments, and then what handler we want to use. So we're waiting on CREG, CEREG, and CGREG as unsolicited commands. And once they uh, show up, um, we essentially check, OK, if we check all of these different uh, statuses, are we actually registered? And if yes, we send an event saying we're registered. Um, so yeah, and the entire driver here is event driven. There's uh, no polling in it. Nice. Um, and okay. yeah, the, that's one thing to say about the uh, subsystem. The entire subsystem is asynchronous as well. Um, there are APIs to help a bit if you want to make a, a synchronous call. So sometimes it is just a lot simpler if you are essentially making calls in uh, a controlling thread. So for the GNSS mode, for example, that one is not um, when you, for example, want to set something up or send a command to resume it. Uh, in that case, it is uh, using synchronous commands. So you can send a script, it's called. So send some commands and wait for a response synchronously if you want to. Um, but it will block the thread that's calling it. But everything internally is asynchronous. So um, yeah, and it's working with the uh, system work queue as well. So everything from the back end saying, hey, I received something, we'll send an event up uh, through the pipe API, okay. which will tell, for example, chat modem, hey, I received something, which will then create a task to go ahead and read that, which will then process it. And then whatever it needs to do, we'll create a new task for it. So everything is yeah, uh, happening in the system uh, work queue thread asynchronously, which is also making it yeah one of the things that made it very thread safe, because since everything is being performed in the same thread, there are very few things that need to be, uh, yeah, uh, what okay, uh, threat safe. Uh, you don't really need to use too many mutexes when you cannot physically be handling or responding to two different work items at the same time because you just have one thread. So the yeah, the modem pipe API is actually the only um, part that is blocking. So when you, yeah, because it essentially has to be when you are reconfiguring it um, or sending or transmitting something, it will make sure that whatever is on the other end doesn't change while you're sending or receiving something. So uh, right. yeah, yep. the pipe is used from the application side of it to make it safe to use. So you can switch from pipe connected to one module to another module without breaking something. But everything okay. else is yeah just event-based in the system work queue. OK. So yeah, we are sort of running out of time, but there's one last question. Hopefully, it calls for a, almost a, a yes, no answer. But uh, this is from Ben. And I think this is actually uh, a really cool idea. Uh, ben says, uh, I presume one of the key benefits of using PPP is that you could potentially repeat the endpoint demo using a PC instead of the cellular modem, and therefore avoiding cellular SIM card costs while testing. Is this something that you've tried yourself that would be possible? Um, I'm not tried that now. I don't see what would prevent you from doing that, <laughs> but but no, I'm not uh, tried it myself. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, with that, I think we're like I said, we're kind of running out of time. There were tons of questions today. Uh, if you are watching us, uh, if you're watching the recording, basically, feel free to just comment right in the um, in the comments below, either, whether on YouTube or LinkedIn, and we will make sure to uh, to get those questions answered. Make sure to subscribe as well, whether uh, you're watching us on LinkedIn or YouTube. This is going to I mean, this is making a huge difference, actually, whether you subscribe, like the video, share it. I, I already saw some people uh, um, and like talking about it on Twitter and so on. If you liked it, basically, uh, yeah, to tell the world um, that that'd be much, much appreciated. With that, uh, we will be back in um, a few weeks time, in two weeks, um, uh, kind of a uh, follow up uh, to the session, uh, the first session we had um, with Mike a few weeks ago. Um, 
continuing the conversation around continuous integration and specifically using uh, Renode, which is a pretty cool open source simulation framework. So look out for, uh, I mean, it's already um, uh, listed on LinkedIn and YouTube, so you can already uh, click the bell, sign up, like get the, uh, the reminders um, in just about two weeks. Uh, Bjarki, we can find you on uh, Discord or in GitHub. Yeah. If people have issues, they just open issues against you and your subsystem, right? Yes, I dare you. <laughs> no, yeah, awesome. I, I really love that. Um, as much, yeah. Well, but really thanks better. again for, for joining us. I know uh, this, I mean, this is something that's uh, super, uh, um, like you're pretty passionate about the topic, but still you took the time to prepare cool demos and so on. So that's uh, uh, much appreciated. And uh, yeah, with that, we will see each of you hopefully again in two weeks. Bye. Bye.